say hi and welcome to the vlog we are enjoying the fact that it is actually outdoor kind of temperatures in the garden for a little bit we're taking it fairly easy today aren't we Ellen? yeah fairly easy and we have had lots of snuggles and we've done a bit of resting not really napping but a bit of resting today i feel like maybe i've been a little bit quiet on youtube lately which is um, just my brain saying you're not doing enough because looking into it I actually haven't been all that quiet I just haven't posted a new vlog every day can you imagine how much work goes into daily vlogging it is quite spectacular especially when you have other things that you want to do and achieve so I have spent time on other things I am spending a lot of time on studying at the moment I'm studying mental health first aid and I'm studying how to become a coach a mindset management coach so I'm having a lot of fun and I'm learning so much and my brain is so overwhelmed at the moment. I went to bed at 8.30 last night because I was just, I couldn't do any more thinking <laughs> and any more functioning. And Elian had fallen asleep and she then woke up multiple times in the night, but there we are. However, all of this rambling is meant to lead into the topic of this vlog, which is recovery from depression and anxiety disorder. This is the diagnosis that I was given by the doctor last year when I sought help for my mental health. Depression and anxiety disorder. Here in the UK, this is recognized as a mental illness and it's covered by the Mental Health Care Act. And I have spoken a fair amount about mental health here on the YouTube channel and I'm going to keep being open about it and I'm going to keep talk about it because I think it is so important. It is super important for all of you who are watching this because the vast majority of you who are watching this are either parents of special needs children or parents who have lost children or you are adults living with disabilities. Somebody told me, <laughs> this, made my, this, this actually made my head blow, it's going to make your heads blow as well. A disabled person had told an able-bodied person that they were seeking help for their mental health and the response they got was how can you have mental health problems you're disabled and this person had to then explain that very often these go hand in hand I actually, when I was told this, I actually put my head, hands on my head in an attempt to keep my head from exploding. I was that shocked. <laughs> I really was. And I'm still kind of gobsmacked and I have a feeling of just disbelief that somebody would say a thing like that. But there you have it. Somebody did say a thing like that. And uh, we can all of us get mental health problems. One in four adults will at least once in their life experience mental ill health. I have to admit I think that is a very low number. I think that's an incredibly low number, I don't believe in it. But then I suppose that this is taken from actual diagnosis numbers, NHS data. So I think it is a lot higher than that. It is known that mental health problems are higher amongst parent carers. And it is known that mental health problems are higher amongst disabled and special needs adults. So, <laughs> let's talk about depression and anxiety. I did post 12 tips for coping with depression and I got so many other suggestions from you guys, what you do to help you out. One of my favorites is get up every day and put on makeup. Literally show up for yourself every day. No matter how crap you feel, get up and show up for yourself. You are the most important person here. Another one was um, chanting the word asshole. And I love it. That is so similar to me writing the word wanker prettily in my bullet journal. Chant the word asshole over and over. Just, yeah, oh my God, how cathartic is that? Just sing the swear words. <laughs> I genuinely know a swear word song, but it's in Swedish, so. <laughs> I might sing it at the end. So there were so many fantastic and wonderful suggestions from all of you guys on that. So I advise that if you haven't seen it, go and watch it. If you have seen it, go back and watch it again and read through the comments and you will get so much wonderful advice. But I wanted to have a little bit of a conversation with you guys about 
my journey of developing depression and anxiety disorder and the recovery that I am now on and where I'm at and how I got here. And where are we now? We are in the middle of April 2022. I realized I accepted that I was depressed around June last year. So almost a year ago. I can clearly, you know, hindsight is 2020. I can clearly now see signs that I was heading into this depression and I probably had clinical symptoms of depression before that, but by June, there was no doubt in my mind whatsoever how bad I was starting to get. Bearing in mind that a year and a half ago now, actually a little bit more, but over the summer in 2020 is when I separated from my husband. A month after I had told him that I was leaving him, I moved out of the house we shared. I moved into my own place and two weeks after moving into my own place, I was made redundant from a job I had held for 11 years. So in the time span of six weeks, I left my husband, moved into my own place and lost my job. And I lost enormous chunks of what was my identity, my feeling of self-worth, my purpose in life, my place in society. It was pulled out from underneath me and it was absolutely terrifying. I took a very conscious decision to try and focus on me, to use my redundancy payment to invest in myself, to invest in starting a business and getting back on my feet that way and not try to immediately throw myself into another corporate job. A part of me is thinking that maybe this was a stupid decision. I could have had a deposit for another place to buy and I could have had a secure income that I don't have at the moment. And so much of my anxiety is money related, but it was a decision I took and considering what I have needed to do for myself in order to recover, I genuinely believe I made the right decision even if it has put me in a situation that is very, very tough and difficult to manage. So by June last year, I was in no doubt that I was definitely depressed. In July, I first sought medical health help. And at that point, I wanted to try and get better with the help of therapy. And I self-referred to the NHS wellbeing service, which is the part of NHS that deals with mental health issues. And I was waiting to get somewhere with that and my mental health my mood kind of took a deep dive from there i have season affective disorder i feel depressed every winter when i don't get enough sunlight and um, so i got my season affective disorder on top of my already existing depression why are you laughing at this that or are you are you cheering me on saying you go mummy Oh, is that what you're doing? Thank you. I thought you were taking the mickey. Were you taking the mickey? <laughs> Where was I? Yes. Winter depression on top of my already existing depression and my mental health took a nosedive. I went on antidepressants. So here is one of the things that I did for myself to recover. I went on an antidepressant that is called sertraline. And the three weeks following me starting sertraline were absolute hell. I was so bad. I was terrified to leave my house. I was crying. I couldn't hide my crying from my children. I actually put myself on sick leave from my own business and from having to prove things to Universal Credit for my <laughs> for my benefits and in order to just give myself a bit of a break I uh, took time out from all my responsibilities and maybe that was good maybe it wasn't I mean all the to-dos were still there when I when I went back to life after having taken sick leave from life and it was really really difficult to catch up and start to sort of show up to myself after that but I also don't necessarily think that I absolutely had a choice in the matter. Uh, I have access to another wonderful antidepressant, which is this, and it's now looking a little sad because I picked it about half an hour ago. This is lemon balm, and it's taking over 
my garden. <laughs> lemon balm is of the mint family and mint has a tendency to just kind of go Rrr! my lemon balm is taking over my mint <laughs> so this one is really flourishing and lemon balm helps you sleep at night and it also helps regulate mood um, I would say I have to say no I don't have to I don't have a legal obligation to but I feel I should say that a little bit of caution should always be exercised with herbal remedies and look into if you are on any medications where it's known that using lemon balm is counterproductive I don't have any of those so I use lemon balm and I really like the sleep the quality of sleep I get on it and I also feel a lot calmer in my mind when I drink lemon balm tea and it tastes divine it is so nice it's such a lovely drink to have at night and of course my bullet journal of keeping myself organized, planning my days, planning my weeks, knowing what's to come, setting tasks that I want to achieve and marking off when I achieve them and making sure that I don't over plan, that I don't overreach, uh, but also that I don't lose sight of the things that I want to do. I then eventually got some help from the NHS Wellbeing Service. I was put in a therapy course, a group therapy course for dealing with mood, a mood management course. And um, not to put too fine a point of it, it was absolute shit. I was extremely disappointed by this. It was a course that was very much aimed at people who are pacified from their depressions. And we were constantly given homeworks to activate ourselves. Homeworks to create things to do and go and do them. My problem was not that I was passive. My problem was that I felt so overwhelmed by everything that that really caused anxiety. It didn't sit very well with me. I actually left each session feeling worse than I did before I started. I did speak to the course leader part way through and I said I'm not sure this is the right forum for me and I asked for individual counselling. I was pushed straight back into this course. I was quite badly dismissed and I was very, very upset by that phone call. So I finished the course and my feedback was that this was not the right setting for me. <laughs> it was not suitable for my situation and uh, I asked for individual counselling and this is an ongoing. I have actually finally been re referred. Um, I'm not entirely sure that I want to go through this wellbeing service for individual counselling because I just feel that they handled me so badly in all of this. But this is still something that I need to work out in my mind. I also found another group online course. And I've talked about this one, actually I talked about it in my vlog, uh, my, my, one of my first Covid vlogs when I had Covid, <laughs> which is quite funny. And this is the parent carer workshop that I'm on, which is a 12 week programme to become a healthy parent carer. First of all, this course is run by and run for parent carers, special needs parents, all of us who are there are special needs parents and the people who run it are special needs parents. This kind of feeling that I had of the other course that it was completely irrelevant, I really don't feel with this one because this is people who are in a similar situation to me and feel similar things to me and face similar challenges to me and all of a sudden this is making a lot more sense. It is significantly more holistic. It is looking at us individuals as complete beings. <laughs> And complete wellness, holistic wellness, is physical wellness as well as emotional wellness. It is things like being active, being outdoors, eating well, connecting with people, but also connecting with ourselves, with mindfulness, with learning new things, stretching our minds, discovering new stuff and new skills. And about giving, being generous, being generous to others, being generous to ourselves. Um, and it's also talking a lot about sleep and about rest, though I haven't come to those units yet. They are the two I've got left and it's going to be very interesting because I have a lot of opinions about sleep advice. <laughs> I'm sure you've heard them. If you haven't, very, very short version is if you tell a special needs parent that they have to sleep more, you have told them they failed before they're even out of bed in the morning and you should just go somewhere else and shut up. That's what I think about that one. Little Miss, I was awake five times last night. Yeah? Yeah? 
five times I got up and helped you last night. Yeah, I did. Yeah, I did. It's a good thing you're cute. Love you. This cause was much more relevant. And in this cause, there is still an aspect of goal setting, but it's very, very different. And the facilitator of the course is talking through our goals with us. The sort of idea around these goals is what would you like to achieve? Thinking about, okay, what can you do to achieve this? And what barriers do you have towards achieving it? What potential barriers? I wanted to go out for a walk three times that week, but I was suffering from such bad post-COVID fatigue that I wasn't entirely sure if I could make that. And as it turned out, I had to adjust my goal quite significantly in order to make it. I did one walk with Ellie and I pushed her wheelchair down to a charity shop not too far away from here. It's like a four minute walk down to that charity shop and back again and I had to sit down because I was dizzy. But the facilitator of the course actually talked this particular goal through with me and, and talked through the barriers and went, okay, so how can you, if you face any of these barriers, how can you readjust your goal in order to meet it? And this is not saying I oh, will push through anyway or anything like that but she said how about walking up and down the street three times get out of your door take a few steps to the left and a few steps to the right and coming back in again um, so it's adjusting the goal that way actually looking at what is genuinely realistic so whilst you might set a goal here part way through you might realize you're not going to hit it but rather than not doing it at all thinking well if I lower the goal to here I'm going to be much closer to it and that is a completely different mindset and that really opened up so much in my head of a lot of self-sabotaging that I definitely was doing while depressed well I'm not going to be able to achieve this I'm not going to do anything kind of thinking uh, a lot of failure thinking I'm a failure and I can't do anything thinking so this particular program has been life-changing it's been mind-blowing it's been amazing I then discovered the Unfuck Your Brain podcast, which I really, really recommend. It's an American mindset management coach and life coach. She is hilarious. She swears more than I do, which is quite impressive. So everything in this podcast is about how to manage your mind to cope with things better. But also it really pushes me at least. I'm sure it will do you as well if you, if you listen to it out of my comfort zone and to stretch myself and challenge myself and really try and do more stuff. So I am now a paying member of that community and I'm getting so much coaching help and help with my mindset and I've been working so hard on it. I sent a message to a friend yesterday and I was saying I am so deep in my mind right now that I have barely any space for anything else but I'm also so excited about what's to come. And I think this mindset management, this coaching, on top of the parent carer group and this mindset management and coaching is what really set me firmly on the path of recovery from my depression and anxiety disorder. With the help of antidepressants, with the help of giving myself a heck of a lot of grace, <coughs> yeah, a heck of a lot, not giving up on myself no matter what. I haven't given up on myself and it's funny because I mentioned about being a failure and not managing anything and not doing anything and I've looked through my bullet journal I've looked back on it and I've gone but whilst I was developing this depression so going from you know having the occasional iffy day to having mostly iffy days to having only iffy days I built a website which is something I had no idea how to do before so I had to research it and learn it. I wrote a business plan. I launched a blog. I've kept up with the vlogging. I have managed everything around the children. Eileen has had so many hospitalizations during this time, both planned for and unexpected that I've dealt with. I have given so much to you guys in terms of time and support and Actually, that is one of the things that has really kept me going, that the fact that I show up for you and you guys show up for me and I love you all. You're amazing. And I've made time for friends and I have been 
going to visit friends, going away from home and doing things and I have managed a lot of money anxiety in the meantime and I have solved quite a lot of money problems as well in the meantime. Um, not quite where I want to be but you know we're getting there. I started earning AdSense on my YouTube channel. I have grown my social media following. Like I've done so many amazing things whilst I was still feeling absolutely shit. This was quite an eye opener and I literally just was looking through my journal before I pressed record and I'm like I achieved all this stuff and I thought I hadn't achieved anything. I felt like a failure, but really I'm, I'm not a failure. So where am I now? My anxiety disorder is still here. It is much less, it is better managed, but I do still have days when I can't cope with certain things. My anxiety is linked to shops. I feel extremely anxious going to the supermarket and buying food. And I had such an anxiety attack in Primark the other week that I walked out, I left the shop, I couldn't cope. <laughs> so um, that is still happening and that is still something I'm really, really working on. I'm also extremely triggered by anything to do with money and today I have paid a lot of big bills, so I am tired. <laughs> I am mentally very tired today because I have done something that I find so difficult. But I have also talked about, when I've talked about mental health, I have talked about cutting yourself some slack, allowing some things to give. And I have had to let a lot of stuff give. Among the things that had to give was the state of my home and I don't like living in a messy home. Uh, I want, I really want minimalism and perfectly tidy all the time, but that's, you know, that that is a work in progress. And for several months the state of my house was actually bringing me down but I was so down already that I couldn't do anything about it and I couldn't afford to pay somebody to come in and do it for me. So that was, I was stuck in quite a nasty cycle there. Now I am happy with my dining room, I am extremely happy with my bedroom, I'm extremely happy with Alice's room, my office still needs so much work. It really needs so much work and the kitchen, uh, there's always washing up and laundry so the kitchen kind of needs a bit of work. And as for my front room, when Eileen is here, that's her bedroom and that it, it works as her bedroom. When she's not here, it is a beautiful front room and such a wonderful atmosphere to be in that um, I'm very proud of myself. So I have gone from literally my entire house just being a bombshell to I have regained control of most of it and I can keep gaining control of the rest as and when I get more and more energy. My Toastmasters has had to give and this is something I do feel bad about because other people have been relying on me to show up and do what I say I'm going to do and other people have had to pick up everything that I haven't done. I am in a Toastmasters club where the members are wonderful and where my Toastmaster president is so understanding and generous that I know that if I told her this or when she watches this vlog, hi Pearlie, she will turn around and say to me, it is okay. It is okay, we're just really happy that you're still in the club and we're really happy that you are recovering and I know we're gonna see you back. I know she will say that, but I do still feel bad because I, I do genuinely feel like I have let people down. And that makes it a bit difficult to deal with, but things have had to give. I have walked away from so many arguments with the girl's father, where possibly I ought to have stood up for myself more and I've chosen not to because I just can't handle that argument. And now I think that this vlog has to end <laughs> because it's already extremely long. But if you've made it this far, thank you so much. Thank you for listening to my ramblings. Thank you for being here for me. Thank you for telling me how grateful you are whenever I'm there for you. And if there is anything that you can share about your journeys to recovery, please do so. And I can't wait to speak to you again. All the best. Bye.